Join us online, we welcome you as well. Our first song this morning will be number 52. Number 52. This morning from Titus chapter 1 beginning in verse 5 those of you that are in auditorium class know this is what we're studying this morning after scripture reading but Joe Polk will lead us in prayer for this reason I left you in Crete that you might set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you namely if any man be above reproach the husband of one wife having children who believe not accused of dissipation or rebellion for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this cause, reprove them severely that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed.
Good to see each of you here. As I mentioned in the reading, we are studying in the book of Titus. We are uh, in chapter 1 of the book of Titus. Uh, many years ago when we lived in Florida, we were attending a congregation down there, and the subject came up of elders and talking about uh, elders and their qualifications and so on, and I ran across something that sort of surprised me, and there's not many things that surprise me. Uh, when what people believe and, and so on, but running this this particular lesson did surprise me. Uh, there was actually one of the elders in the church where I, where we were attending at the time, uh, and the question came up: What and what is it that disqualifies a man from being an elder after he becomes an elder? And how do you go about getting a man? out of that position if, if you feel he's not qualified. And what surprised me was that one of the elders there, he raised his hand and he said, well, the Bible don't say nothing about elders ever coming out, so once you're an elder, you're always an elder, and I believe that God will shield you so that you don't ever become disqualified and you serve as long as you live. <laughs> and that surprised me. Uh, not, not many things have I, like I said, have I heard over the years that, that surprised me, but that was in fact one of them that, that did surprise me as, uh, in that position. And then I got thinking about it as, as we were studying this lesson, I got thinking about it, and we talked about it a little bit when, back before we appointed elders not too long ago, and, and one of the things that, that we talked about a little bit, and some of us more in private than maybe in the class or something, but uh, there's not a lot said about how you go about appointing elders. Paul told Timothy, you appoint elders. He told Titus, you appoint elders. Uh, Paul and Barnabas went through the cities appointing elders. But there's nothing told us about how you go about doing this. What is the procedure for doing it? And so we just sort of uh, take how the seven men were chosen that we believe to be deacons in the book of Acts in the early part of the church and, and how the apostles told them to go about doing that and we take that and say, okay, we know that method worked for them and so we'll use that same method and we do that. But at least the premise of what this elder was saying down there uh, in Florida is true and that is there's absolutely nothing said about a man not being an elder after he becomes an elder. Uh, so does does that mean then that that he's right that we once you become an elder you need just to always be one no matter what? No. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Yeah. Okay. Okay. On on the basis of. He could not perform the function that he was supposed to because of his capacity physically, mentally, whatever. And he decided that he, he shouldn't serve and, and resign from being an elder. And, and I, I think that's, that's wise. I, I do. Dwight, do you say? That's what I was trying to remember where though. It may be, I don't know. But, but what, how would that, oh, go ahead, Joel. That being said, we don't have that process in this system, and we do have that process. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and that, that was what I was fixing to say. Uh, and and I've, I'm, I'm not saying it's not there because I don't, but I don't remember. I was trying to rack my brain, remember the passage, and it's probably my memory is the problem uh, that says that, uh, uh, 
the, you're right. It's a passage that says to something about overseeing the flock over which the, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's the verse, but I don't remember it. I thought that was in 1 Peter 5, but I looked there and didn't see it uh, while, while you were talking. It may be there, and I just overlooked it. But, uh, okay, let's, so we agree then that the Holy Spirit is the one who uh, makes us overseers. What does that have to do with whether or not a man can become unqualified and not serve anymore? Make you more conscious. Okay, so it should make you more conscious of what you are doing, what you're, what's going on in your life, and what the abilities are, and what you not or whatever to. Yeah, in order to serve. Okay, because you are. It does. So it would add responsibility to your service. Uh, the fact is, though, the, does the Holy Spirit not make us Christians as well? The Holy Spirit makes us Christians in the first place. Now, does that mean that a man can can become unfaithful and not not be faithful to the Lord anymore? Okay, we can quench the Spirit. We can we can put out the Spirit's fire. So, yeah. So that doesn't really. While it's true, it doesn't really change this a whole lot other than adding responsibility. What about a situation uh, where? A man's wife dies. Is, is he qualified to continue to serve? Not a husband of one wife? Okay. Uh, and to be quite honest, for most of my life, I believed that even though his wife had died, he still would be qualified because he had a wife when he was appointed. Uh, I have changed my mind on that in recent years. Uh, I don't believe that now. But there was a time when... I did, uh, and and so I, I think that that a man in wisdom would step down uh, uh, to do it. One of the things about and and I know we've we've had here as well as other congregations where I've been, there have been people that have resigned from being elders because of some family situation, maybe children, maybe wife, maybe something else that was involved in their family and. And they decided that they were not qualified now, even though they were when they were appointed, uh, and and have resigned because of that. Uh, what does that do as far as the person is concerned that that resigns in that kind of situation? Uh, okay, it, it probably yeah, probably people would respect that one more because he does recognize that. And I think that's one of the keys to the whole thing is that if a person really is qualified from his heart and, and he is the kind of person he ought to be, then he's going to recognize when things are not right in his life and he doesn't need to be serving anymore, whether it's physical or mental or a family situation or something else in his life. Maybe uh, I, I know a guy that that was accused of, embezzling a whole bunch of money. He didn't do it. Uh, he, he was not guilty of what he was accused of. But it made the newspaper, and it was a big thing, and he was an elder, and, and he resigned, not because he was guilty, but because he knew that his influence, at least for the time being, until he could be exonerated, his influence was not going to be good, and it would hurt the church. And so he resigned. And I think that demonstrates the kind of heart that a man who is an elder ought to have and says, okay, you know, if, if my serving is not going to make things better, then I don't need to be in there. Yeah. My father retired from being an elder when he reached the point and began to understand that his memory wasn't quite used to. And so in order, to, in order to avoid making a mistake, he retired. Yeah. And I always thought, good for you, Dad. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like I said, I've, I've known people that have resigned for a number of different reasons, and, and without exception, I have more respect for them because they did than for the ones that don't, that should. Uh, that's, there's no question about that. As, as I was studying this lesson, I, I began looking at, I went back to Timothy, and, and I printed out uh, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and 
and, and looking at that as, as along with Titus 1, 6 through 9. And then I looked over it and I mentioned a while ago 1 Peter chapter 5. Turn, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning verse 1, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet is lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And... As I read that, the one thing that really stood out in my mind in that passage as much as anything else is the idea that serving as an elder is setting the right kind of example. It's leading by example. Uh, it's not just making decisions and saying this is the way it's going to be. It's not being demanding about things. It's not uh, just telling people what to do even though an elder is supposed to be able to, to teach and to refute false doctrine and so his primary job, primary job as, as an elder is leading, and, and that means that he's got to do it right himself and set the right example. Now, if my life is not what it ought to be, or if there's other things about me that's not what it should be, how many people are going to want to follow me? Not, not many, if any, no. There might be somebody just because they like Robert... <laughs> They would, but, but for the most part, they're not going to uh, because they look at me and they look at the Scripture and they say, this is not right. I'm, you know, I don't want to do that. Uh, and so I think that, that we have to look at that example part of it. Now, think about that as we look at these qualifications here. And, and so as, as we look at these, he says, a man is to be above reproach. So, so why would a man, as an elder, need, we've already looked at that some, but why would a man want to be above reproach? Okay, the example, if, if there are accusations that can be made against me that you can substantiate without any problem and, and I'm obviously not doing what's right, then I'm not going to be any kind of good example for anybody. And, and that's, that's what he's saying there. And, and then he talks about the family. He talks about having a wife. And we talked about some of the reasons behind that in, in extending hospitality and, and just having the support of a wife and so on. Talked about having uh, believing children. And, you know, Timothy talks about that. Uh, he said that he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And so he says, this is the, the proven ground, is the home. And if, if he, can, he can't manage his home, then he don't need to be managing the church. Uh, and so we have, have these. Now, number six, the overseer is to serve as God's what? Steward. Steward. Okay. If you go back and you look at 1 Timothy, that particular wording is not in there but if you'll remember 1 Timothy 3 he begins by saying it's a trustworthy statement if a man aspires to the office of overseer it's a fine work he desires to do what is, what is a steward it's a worker it's somebody that's over something that has been given to his charge and so Timothy, even though Paul doesn't use the same words there with Timothy, the same idea is there. It, he's, his job is to oversee and to work and, and to see that the church is what it should be. He says he's not to be what? Number seven, not self-willed and not, not quick-tempered. Okay, let's just stop right there with those two. Uh, Again, these words are not used in uh, 1 Timothy specifically like this. But the idea of being temperate, which is used in 1 Timothy, he says he is to be temperate. That's the, 
positive side of these negative terms here. What, what does it mean, not self-willed? Okay. Got, got to have your own way? Somebody say something else? Okay. I, I, was in, I, I looked at several different translations. One of them says not stubborn. Uh, one of them said not headstrong, uh, which just means, you know, not, not always got to be your way. And that's, that's what it is. Not quick-tempered. Yeah. Okay. Not not self will meaning then that we do what we want to do as opposed to doing what God wants us to do, what the Scripture says. Okay. Yeah, and I think that definitely would be involved in it. Uh, it, it, it probably is broader than that. You know, uh, just having to have our own way. Uh, and and I'm gonna tell you, I have I have seen uh, elders in churches that basically they. You know, they said, we're going to make the rules and everybody's going to do what we tell them. Uh, there's a church that I know of that decided that uh, everybody in that church needed to use new, the New King James Version of the Bible. And so they issued an order forbidding anybody in that church to study or use any translation other than the New King James. Uh, guess what? There were some people left. <laughs> uh, that's way beyond the purview of what elders are supposed to be doing. I mean, I can I can see maybe the elders suggesting that we use this, or maybe even in our Bible classes we're going to study from this translation just for the sake of harmony and unity so everybody's got the same thing when they're studying. Uh, I know at school the classes, it's up to the teacher, but the teacher tells the class at the beginning of the year in Bible class, this is the what this is the translation we're going to be studying from. Well, I mean that makes sense, so that all the kids have the same translation when they're you know studying and answering stuff and so on. And and I could see that even in the church saying, okay, in our classes, let's use this translation. But to, to, to issue an order that nobody's going to read from or use any other translation, that's that's going way beyond that. So, uh, but but the idea is that. That that's, that's not, you know, that's self-will. That's saying, I like this one, and since I like it, you're going to like it too. Uh, that's not the way it's supposed to be. All right, not self-will, not quick-tempered. And that also is a part of being temperate. Uh, not being, uh, one, one translation said, not a hothead. Uh, and, and there's some people that just have a very difficult time controlling their temper. And they are, in fact, quick-tempered. And why would you not want a man that was quick-tempered to be serving as an elder? Okay, you make bad choices if you're quick-tempered. Uh, another reason, and I can assure you, and those of you who have served as elders or worked with elders closely, uh, you know there are times when you have confrontations with people uh, within the congregation over various things and and if you're quick tempered then you end up making matters worse instead of better uh, it, it, you need to have a, a, a temperate attitude is, is what Timothy puts it alright not addicted to wine not pugnacious which I thought was interesting those two sort of uh, go together I think uh, in fact over in Timothy he puts the t same two together not addicted to wine and not pugnacious uh, being addicted to wine means what a drunk okay yeah yeah alcoholic a, a drunk yeah so you don't want somebody like that what does pugnacious mean some of the other translations use a different word do what violent okay one translation says not a brawler. Uh, one, another translation said uh, not a striker. Uh, have you ever met somebody just ready to fight at the drop of a hat? That's, there are some people like that. They just, they just want to fight. You know, just the least little thing. They'll fight you. Uh, and I don't know that we see it as much today as, as we used to. Uh, 
Yeah, the day they just shoot you, yeah. Uh, this ain't got anything to do with the lesson, but I, I thought about it, and maybe it does too. I, I thought about it when you said they shoot you. Uh, did, uh, oh, what was his name? Harris. There used to be a, a black preacher, and his last name was Harris. John Harris was his name. John Harris. Everybody call him Big John. Uh, John Harris was probably close to, he was about the size of Larry Vincent, only a whole lot heavier. Uh, he, was, he was a big, big guy. And the first time I ever saw him, he came in the bookstore, uh, the CEI store, when I was about this big, uh, and just a little bitty kid, and he was looking at books, and I came around the corner, and all of a sudden, this huge black giant was standing in front of me. I looked up, and it scared me to death. And uh, got to know him, though, over a period of time, and uh, he, he and my daddy were good friends. And anyway, I got, I got to know him pretty well. So one day, and of course, I was just a little kid still, and one day I asked him, I said, made some comment, I said, I bet as big as you are, you don't have to worry about anybody messing with you. He said, you just whip anybody, won't you? He says, man, no. He said, I go out of my way to be peaceful and get along with everybody because I'm so big, they know they can't whip me, they just pull out a gun and shoot me. <laughs> so he, he was one of these that was a, a peaceful guy because he didn't want to get in a fight. Uh, but, but Brother John was a, a good man. He, he passed away about probably 10 years ago. Uh, some of you knew Freeman Malone Sr. Uh, here in Athens, there was a Freeman Jr. who also has passed away now, but uh, John married one of Freeman's daughters. Uh, and, uh, but uh, he, was, he, was, he was a good man. But not pugnacious, uh, not ready to fight. Then he says, not fond of what? Sordid gain. gain. Now what is, what is sordid gain? Gain. I think some translations say filthy lucre. Okay, money gotten in bad ways. Uh, and I think probably another way of putting that really would just be greedy. You know, want it no matter what. Uh, and to make it how we get it. Uh, and, and I thought something was interesting about that too. Uh, Hang on one second. Look at verse 11. Verses 10 and 11 of, of this same chapter. He says, There are many rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. So here you have these people that are false teachers and they're doing it for the money. They, they're just in it for the money. That's all. And, and I think the sordid gain, it becomes wrong motives and sordid when we start trying to make money out of serving God. When we're doing it for the sake of the money. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I've, I've told you before about the, the guy, when my granddaddy was a missionary in Africa, and there was a guy came to him one day, and he said, do you need a preacher to help you? And he said, well, what religion are you? And he he said, well, it doesn't really matter. He said, I belong to this church, but I'll preach whatever if the money's good enough. So, you know, there are some people that are like that. You know, it, it doesn't matter really. Uh, and, and they're not in it for the sake of preaching the gospel. They're not in it for the sake of trying to save souls. They're just in it for what they can get out of it. Uh, and, and so he says, don't, don't, uh, you don't want a man that's going to just serve so he can make money out of it. But rather, and those are the negative things that are given, but rather he is to be what? Hospitable. What does the word hospitable mean? A good person to be around, person to be around? okay. Showing hospitality to others, okay. Okay. Technically and literally, the Greek word that is there means a lover of strangers. That's what it means. Now, given their culture, and it's not a lot said about it in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament there are several instances where somebody was traveling 
and they would get to a town and what was what was the custom then for people to do especially if they were Jewish people they would invite them into their home they would come into town they didn't know who they were but they would say okay can you come on and stay with me uh, and later after the church began Christians from what we read in secular history Christians practice this same thing and so when Christians were traveling and they went into a town they would associate themselves with other Christians and they would be invited into their homes and they would stay there and if you look at the missionary journeys of Paul and the letters of Paul that seems to be exactly what was going on they would very often move into a town and they would stay with somebody while they were there uh, and, and so a lover of stranger just means that you take people in uh, that, that need a place to stay is, is really what it means. Now in our vocabulary today, uh, practicing hospitality has come more to mean, uh, in, in our thinking, more to mean inviting people into our homes and, and having people in our homes and, and so on. Uh, and while I think that can be a part of it, that the, the original meaning of it is not really that. Uh, but I, I think just being, being friendly, being nice to people, being cordial to people is a part of, of hospitality. It doesn't necessarily. I mean, you can be friendly to a stranger, you know, uh, without inviting them into your home even. Uh, I, I do know of, I know of uh, actually two or three different people that, that consistently will fix a meal on Sundays big enough to feed a whole bunch of people. And if they have strangers that come to visit with them at church on that Sunday, they will invite all the strangers to come home with them and eat. And then if they don't have any visitors, they just invite people from the church to come eat with them. Uh, and they'll get different people pretty much every week. And, and I know two or three people that do this uh, regularly. Uh, and, and I think that's a part of, that would be practicing hospitality in that sense. Yeah, that's uh, m mama's had had a way of doing that. Didn't that's back? That was back when the grown ups ate first and the kids ate last. Things have changed drastically. Now, now they think they're supposed to feed the kids first and let the grown ups eat last. We we were told you go out and play, and when everybody else is eating, we'll call you and you can come get get something to eat. They wouldn't even know how to play outside now. Most of them. Uh, okay, so he's to be hospitable, and then what else? Okay, loving what is good. And again, a literal translation there says a lover of good men. Uh, and so we don't just love good, but we love good people. Uh, and, and love to be around good people. And, and, and Christians, while we are not to be exclusively around other Christians because we'd never convert anybody if that's, if that's the way we lived our lives. At the same time, our closest companions should be other Christians. And it should be people that are, have a, a like faith and, and, and we encourage each other in doing that. Uh, and, and so we should be lovers of good people, love to be around good people. All right, what's the next one? Sober-minded, okay. Uh, New American Standard says sensible. Uh, one translation said prudent. Uh, and so sober-minded just means a person who is sensible. Uh, that is, he, he makes good decisions. He thinks about what he's doing. He's, he's rational in his behavior and so on. All right, what's the next one? Just, just okay. Uh, the idea of being just means what? Fair. Fair? Okay. Uh, and again, one translation uses the word righteous. He's to be a righteous person. He's, he's to be fair. He's to be just. Uh, and the next one is holy. Okay. Another translation says devout. Uh, one translation said respectable. 
one one idea was that it is to be a person who is genuine, not hypocritical, not pretentious. Uh, all of those, I think, would go to make up that kind of a person. Uh, is to be what else? Self-controlled. Okay, and this again, this goes back to the the idea of temperate and uh, and so on. Uh, as I was reading this, and I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself here. As I was reading this and, and reading through Titus, in Titus chapter two. He says the older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, and sound in love, and sound in perseverance. Now that sounds a whole lot like these qualifications for elders, doesn't it? He says the older women are to be reverent in behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, and encouraging young women, uh, wives, and mothers. Again, even for the women, that sounds a whole lot like qualifications for elders doesn't it? he says young women are to love their husbands love their children be sensible pure workers at home kind and subject to their own husbands he says young men are to be sensible they're to be a good examples of good deeds purity and doctrine dignified and sound in speech and then he says the bond slaves are to be subject to their masters, well-pleasing, not argumentative, not stealing or pilfering, and showing good faith and trustworthy. So if you look at these things that he's telling every class of people in chapter 2 that they're to be, and you go back and you look at these qualifications that have been given for elders, how much does it fit everybody? Yeah, other than the family situation, yeah. You know, it, it's other than the family situation in the older women, younger women, and, and elders here, every one of these are the same. And if there is family, basically the, it's the same qualifications there. Uh, we, we are, in other words, an elder is going to be an example of all these things that we just read for the older men and the older women and the younger men and the younger women, except for what's specific to their uh, their place like slaves or whatever uh, and certainly there's some things with the women that are a little different than the men but other than that it, it's pretty much the same as far as the behavior of a person and what we really are in our heart and what our lives are it, it's the same and, and so as an elder our job then is to just set a good example of how to be this way and do these things yeah <clears throat> Right. This is the best life to live. You stop and think about it. Compare this life that we're talking about here to the life of any other in the world. And this is by far a better life even on this earth. Right. Than on earth. Certainly okay. eternity will be totally different. But uh, even in this life, it's a better life. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that a lot of people miss. And, that, and those of you that are listening on the internet didn't hear Joel, maybe, but he's saying that if we live the way God wants us to live, we really have a better life even now as well as eternity. Uh, and, and I think that's absolutely right. And that's something that's hard for people a lot of times in the world to see. You know, they think, well, Christianity takes away all my fun. If I'm going to be a Christian, then I can't do this and I can't do that. And can't. The fact is, the things you can't do is, are things that are, you shouldn't be doing anyway if you really want to have a good life. Those things don't add to your true joy or your best health or anything else, you leave those things off. Uh, if you want to have good relationships with your family and with people around you, the best way to do it is to be exactly what God wants you to be as a Christian. That's, that's how you build relationships. So every part of our life, and, and God knows what's best for us, and, and He's given us all this not to hold us down and tie us down, but to give us a, a good life. In fact, Jesus said, I came to give you life and life abundantly. And so he wants us to have the good life. And the good life comes from serving God in Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, 
He says, number nine, he is to hold fast the faithful word so that he may do what? Okay, exhort in sound doctrine and... Okay, refute those who contradict. Paul told Timothy he's to be able to teach. Uh, and that's what this is. And, and sometimes uh, teaching means you have to refute something that's wrong. Sometimes it means building up positively. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. But a man who's going to be an elder needs to be able to do that. Uh, has anybody got any question down through question number nine? Question number ten sort of starts the next paragraph, next section, or, or whatever. All right. I appreciate everybody's comments and uh, I usually don't have a whole bunch of notes, but I had three pages of notes today.
are so thankful for those who are visiting with us as well for being here. And we want to encourage, encourage you as you encourage us. Before we get started in our worship, uh, we have a, a couple announcements that need to be made. Um, Dwight Griffin, which is Ben's dad, is uh, having some serious health issues, and they request our prayers, and so uh, let's keep them in, in our prayers. Also, I'd like to mention that Diane is uh, scheduled for her surgery November 29th at Vanderbilt, and so let's continue to pray for, for them and pray for the doctors that will be performing the surgery. Also, Shirley Long, which is uh, the mother of Cherie and Sean, uh, will be having another surgery Thursday. So let's continue to, to pray for her. I know she's had a, a rough go of it lately. And also, uh, Jennifer Greggs is back in Birmingham uh, sick, and so uh, she, she definitely needs our prayers. Um, so let's pray for all these as, as they are struggling. Well, on a good note, we do re rejoice with uh, Charles and Betty Ham uh, on their baptism in Christ last week, uh, last Monday. And we're so thankful for y'all and y'all's commitment to the Lord. And we just uh, pray for you that uh, you'll encourage us as much as you encourage us. So welcome to the family at Ephesus. Are there any announcements that need to be made at this time that was not given? If not... Uh, we are about to partake of the Lord's Supper. And as we are about to partake of the Lord's Supper, let's get our thoughts right, get our minds right uh, for this. Um, in Exodus chapter 3, they're beginning in verse 7. It says, The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. The children of Israel were in bondage, in Egyptian bondage. And these were the people of God, and God heard their cries and felt compassion on them. And so God sent to them Moses and Aaron to get them out of Egyptian bondage. And one of the biggest moments in the history of the world happened during this time. As God sent Moses and Aaron, we know that Pharaoh was not going to give up the children of Israel just quickly. So God had to send plagues upon the children, or upon Egypt. And it wasn't until the 10th plague, which happened, and during this 10th plague was one of the biggest, biggest moments in the history. And yet it was a dark and dreary day. On the 10th plague was the, the last plague in which the firstborn were going to be put to death. But God told them that if you put blood on your door handle, that the angel of death would pass by. And so that night, all the children of Israel, they put the blood on their doorposts, and the angel of death passed over. And this was a big moment in the history because in this moment, the children of Israel were saved by that blood. And even though it was a dreary day because a lot of people lost a lot of lives, a lot of families lost their sons and daughters. But it was this moment in which the children of Israel were saved. And so God told them that they were to remember this day. If you go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, they're beginning in verse 17. It says, You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought you your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the, of the month, that evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses, for whoever eats leaven, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native of the land. So God told them to observe this day for the rest of their, their existence because this was such an important day that they needed to remember that through that blood, that shedding of the blood on the doorpost that saved them, saved their lives, they were to remember this. And then fast forward years later, the most important day happened. And that was the day that Jesus died. 
that, that Jesus died and he rose from the dead. And that blood that was shed by Jesus, it now saves every single one of us. It now covers our sin. It now saves us from death, from spiritual death. And so those, all of us who are Christians, we have the blood of Jesus that cleanses us, that now saves us. And God has told us to remember this day. Jesus said to remember this day. And so as we come every Sunday, we are to remember while we're here. And that is because of what Jesus did for us. Because Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised. And that blood that Jesus shed on that cross, it saves us. And so as we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper, let us think on these things. Let us remember that Jesus is the reason why we're here and that Jesus and his blood saves us continually. Let us offer thanks for the bread. Father, thank you again for this wonderful Lord's Day that you've blessed us with and uh, for the measure of health you've given each one that we can gather here today to worship you in spirit and in truth, we do pray. And at this time, to partake of this memorial to your Son and our Savior Jesus that was sacrificed on that cruel cross for our sins. We thank you for this bread which represents his body that was so cruelly uh, abused on that cross and help us to remember that sacrifice and partake in a way it's well pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Likewise, Father, we ask you to bless this cup, the fruit of the vine, which to Christians represents Christ's blood that was shed upon that cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Be with us now as we partake and we do so in a well-pleasing manner. In Christ's name, amen. Continue our worship this morning. We'll sing number two. Number two. <coughs> Beautiful prayer. I will make another announcement that uh, wasn't given to Brandon. And he probably wouldn't have announced it had I given it to him. But he will be preaching for us here in just a moment. He has taken Robert's place. Robert originally thought he was going to be out of town today uh, with things going on with them the way it is. Uh, uh, they're, they're here anyway 
but uh, Brendan is lined up to cover for him, and Brother Matt's gone. He's out of town. He'll be out this evening. So we have another guest speaker tonight. Brother Joe Polk will be preaching for us tonight. So let's all try to be here for that as well. Number two. In the Bible, we read of a beautiful prayer, a prayer sent to heaven above. It was prayed by a heart that was laden with care, and it was filled with such wonderful love. When the Savior was praying, he was praying in the garden.
let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this day claiming our right to be here with you and your sons. We thank you, Father, for all of the things you've done for each one of us throughout this life we've lived. Be with us, Father, as we continue to grow, to increase our belief in your Son, that we, Father, may cause others to join with us to become parts of this church we have developed. And we know, Father, that we can do this, and we pray that we will continue to strive hard to, wor to cause those to gather to the worship, sh worship with us as we study and grow wiser and more firm in our belief in you. Father, we know that our lives are short here on your footstool. We pray that we may do the things that we should do, that we may grow the things that we should grow to make your son's word improve each day we're here. We pray to you, Father, that you would always cause us to be wise to do the things that we should do, avoid the things that we should not do. We pray for those, Father, who are sick, struggling with diseases and other things that cause their time here on your footstool to be short. We pray for them and their health that they may return to it. Help those who are attending to those that are sick and struggling with their needs. We pray, Father, that you would always give us an opportunity to extend our lives here long enough to make sure we are in control with ourselves and we are abiding as one of your children each and every day. Father, bless those who are in other worlds that we are not attendant to, but we pray, Father, that they may find the knowledge that they need to turn to your Son and worship Him, irregardless of their attitude and aptitude in the areas they might be, we know, Father, that they need to be a part of your Son and what the belief there is. Father, continue with us through this service. Let us listen to the sermon that will be brought and improve our health and knowledge each and every day. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Something for the lesson will be number 544. 544. <coughs> if any of you would like to stand for this song. <coughs> this reading how I love to proclaim it. Reading by the blood of the Lamb. Reading through His infinite mercy. Is how and forever I am. Reading, reading, reading by the blood of the Lamb. Reading, reading, He is how and forever I am. I will watch now see in His beauty the King in whose love I divide. pretty boring, pretty dead. 
but we're thankful for you being here. We're so thankful for visitors being with us as well. If you want to go ahead and turn your Bible to Malachi chapter 1, Malachi chapter 1, we'll read from there. I don't have a PowerPoint this morning, so uh, if you'll be following along in your Bibles, uh, we'll start in Malachi chapter 1. And if you don't know where Malachi is, it's the last book in the Old Testament and right in front of of Matthew. I know it's not a a book we we read a lot from, but in Malachi chapter 1, they're beginning in verse 6. It says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my respect? Where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect, says the Lord of hosts to you? O priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? For if you are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, how have we defiled you? And that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not for evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is it not for evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you, or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now will you not entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates that you might not usefully kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name. And a grain offering that is pure for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you are profaning it. In that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and as for its fruits, it is food to be despised. You also say how, my, how, how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what is taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so that you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord. But be cursed, be the swindler, who has, made, have a, who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices blemished animals to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Here God speaks through Malachi to the priests of Israel. And basically what he's saying is that I'm not happy with the way you're worshiping me. I'm not pleased at all because you are not giving me what is due to me. You are not respecting me. You are not fearing me as you should. And so God says that because of that, I'm not going to accept your worship and your sacrifice. With that in mind, that, that we should give God our best. Because really, that's what it boils down to right here. Why God is, is upset with the way they're worshiping him is because, number one, they're not worshiping him the way he wants them to. But number two, they're not giving God his, their very best. Because if you go back and you study in, in the Old Testament and, and the, the laws about what God told them to do about sacrificing, that they were supposed to give them the very best of their flocks. Lambs without blemishes, the best. That's what God required of them. And you might be thinking, well, what does it matter if there's a little lame lamb that we're going to sacrifice? Because we're just going to kill it. We're just going to use its blood for this sacrifice. So why does it matter? Because the God who created them, the God who created the world, who brought them out of Egypt, who saved them, he's the God of Almighty, and he deserves their very best. He deserves their very best and deserves to be worshipped the way that he has intended them to worship. Now today, we don't offer sacrifices. We don't get up here and offer a lamb. But today, God still requires us to give him our very best. He still requires us to worship him the way he has intended us to worship him and to worship him exactly like he's asked. 
So with that in mind, with this thought in mind of, of giving God our best, of doing what God has asked us to do, i got a question I want to ask. And it's a question that I want us to think on, think on this week. But we've got to ask ourselves this question. And I know Robert and Matt says this all the time, but uh, that the sermon they're preaching is, is for me. Well, I'm telling you right now, this sermon today, it, it's for me. You're just here to listen. But we've got to ask ourselves this one question. And that is, has our worship become boring? Is our worship boring? Are we coming here doing the same thing every Sunday, every Wednesday? Has that become boring to you? We do the same thing over and over. We sing the same songs. We sing the same prayers. We, we hear the same sermons from the same people. Has that become boring to you? Is worshiping God boring to you? I've had to ask myself that question because I think probably most of us here at some point in our life have, have said, yeah, it's, it's become a little boring. Not to uh, offend anybody, but those of you who are older, you've been worshiping for years and years, doing the same thing over and over. Maybe even worshiping at the same place. I'm sure at some point in your life you said, you know, it's kind of boring. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning, you're saying, yeah, worship has become kind of boring. Well, we, like I said, a lot of us have felt that way. And you may be feeling that way this morning. But it, it's not right. It's not a good thing. Because our God that we worship, he's not a boring God. Nor did he plan on his worship being boring to us. And so... If we're here and we're sitting here saying that worship has become boring, that the things that we're doing, that we're doing over and over, every Sunday, every Wednesday, if it's become boring to you, well, the question is, how do we fix it? How do we fix being bored? How, how can I get to where I come to this, this building every Sunday, every Wednesday, and I'm on fire for the Lord, and I leave just, just on fire for the Lord, where, where, wherever I go the next week, I'm just, it's overflowing. What's the solution to the problem? Well, this is not something new. This is something that mankind has struggled with since really the beginning of time. Really since probably the beginning of the institution of the law of Moses. You know, I, th I think of, the, of when Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. Then he comes down and, and lo and behold, the, the children of Israel, along with Aaron, has made this golden calf. They were, they were probably bored. They were probably bored, and they were trying to find something to, to appease everybody, to make everybody more excited, more happy. And then you, 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 I think about the church at Corinth. If you know anything about the church at Corinth, you know that they had a lot of problems. You know, they, uh, they had a lot of immorality going on. A lot, of, a lot of bad things were going on. And then we get to, to chapter 11. If you'd like to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11... We'll read that real quick. We get to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and then we see that they also had a problem with the Lord's Supper. There in uh, verse 17, it says, But in giving the instructions, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as, I, as a church, I hear divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must be also factions among you, so that those who are proved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and one another is drunk. What? Do, I have, do you not have in your houses which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. It doesn't say it, but I mean, maybe I'm grasping at straws here, but they were probably bored with the Lord's Supper, with doing the same thing over and over. And so they decided, you know what? We're, we're going to start bringing in our, our food from home. We're going to start bringing in some McDonald's, some, some Taco Bell. We're going to bring a, a biggie bag from Wendy's. 
they were going to, we're going to bring a keg of wine. And you want to talk about making a church exciting, we're going to have a buffet and a bar here. We're going to have a lot of excitement going on. I mean, you, you, you're going to have, we're going to have a lot of crowds here. And a lot of us probably going to be, be leaving full and, and drunk. But Paul says that's not the answer. Well, see, see this, this church boredom, this boredom of, of worshiping God, it, it's existed for, for a long time. And we see it today. And, and we see all these different churches, denominations, and they've, they've had at some point some boredom, and so they've tried to figure out some ways to fix it. So what's the solution? What's the solution to, to church boredom? Well, if you ask some people, they will say, you know what, we're, we're going we're gonna to fix this problem. We're going to start having, we're going to bring in a piano. We'll have some, some instrumental music. You know, we're going to bring in some, some guitars, some fiddles, and some, some, some violins. We're going we're gonna to have a band. You know, we're, we're going to have a, a rock concert. We're going to have a light show. We're going we're gonna to have a fog machine. You know, it, it's just going to be a big old concert. That, that'll cure church boredom right there. I don't, I don't know if this is true, and some of you might know this. But I, didn't, I didn't really investigate this, but I heard that uh, a church somewhere uh, tried, to, tried to spice things up a little bit. And so they had the, the preacher to come down in on a Harley Davidson. And, and you want to talk about making some excitement here. Brother Robert came down on here on a Harley Davidson. That would, that would probably <laughs> that would be pretty exciting. I mean, we, if everyone here would video that and put it on Facebook and social media and then we put it on our website, we'd probably have a building full of people. People who's, who's never darkened a church door would probably come here. We'd probably have people from out of town. I'm not going to lie, I probably would pay good money to see that. But, <laughs> but all these things that I've mentioned, people have tried. People have, have done this to to make worship more exciting so that people will not be so bored with worship. And so one thing that all these things have in common is all these things, they're, they're appealing to our emotions. They're appealing to us as humans. They're trying to get us to get stirred up inside. And some will say to, to create this spiritual feeling, this spiritual vibe, so that, that we just get so tingly inside. But all these things are for us. And so if you're sitting here and you're, you're, you're questioning, you know, what can we do to, to cure this problem? And if th that's the answer, I, I want to ask another question. And that is, what are we doing here? What's our purpose for being here this morning? Because if th those things are the answer, then our purpose for being here is it's just to get fulfilled emotionally. To get some kind of, of emotional feeling. But that's not the case. That's not why we're here, is it? Our reason for coming together on the first day of the week, as we have today, it is to worship God. And God alone. We are to worship God with one another. And that's the reason why we're here. It's not to get some emotional feeling. It's not to come away with this tingly little feeling, this spirituality feeling. It, it's to worship God. It's not about us. It's about God. And we don't want to minimize the other reason, and that is that we come here to encourage one another. But the way we encourage one another, it's by worshiping God together, by singing songs of praise and, and doing what God has asked us to do. And so... What, what's the answer to the problem? Why, how can we cure this boredom, this boredom of worshiping? Like I said, man has tried to come up with solutions, and, you know, they fixed it. I mean, it, it fixed it. You know, there are places where you go that they're, they're pretty alive. They're, they're not boring. But, but is that the answer? You know, as humans, you know, when we find a problem going on, whether it's at home or it's at work or even at church, you know, a lot of times we, we try to find someone else to put the blame on, right? 
You know, we, we try to blame somebody else because of what's going on. Well, we do that. And that's why we have all these different, you know, different types of worship because people have blamed it on, on the worship, blamed it on the preacher, blamed it on the elders, blamed it on a lot of things. But you know what? It's not the reason why you're bored. It's not the reason. The reason is us. The reason is my heart. Because if my heart's not right, if my heart is not filled with God, and my heart's not truly devoted to serving God and to living for God and doing what God has asked us to do, coming here, sitting on a pew, being a pew potato, not participating in worship, it's going to be boring. It's going to be boring and you're probably going to fall asleep. So, if you're bored, it's not the worship. It's not the preacher. It might be this morning. Um, but the problem is, is our hearts. It's our hearts. So how do we fix our hearts? So how do, how do we fix our hearts to where every time we come here, we are on fire? Where we're not bored, we're excited to be here. Well... I want to ask, ask, ask a question to answer that, and that is, what are we doing outside of this building? What are we doing outside of these four walls? When we go out after Sunday, throughout the week, what, what are we doing? You know, are, are, we, are we in God's Word every day? Are we studying to see what God asks of us? Are we praying every day? Are we singing songs? Are we, are we filled with His Spirit? Are we thinking on spiritual things outside of this building? You know, Robert and Matt says this all the time, but if the only time that we open God's Word here in this building on Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday, if you come three times a week, if, that, if you open God's Word and that's the only time that you study, the only time you pray, we're never going to be what God wants us to be. We're never going to fully know who God is. Because if you fully know who God is, worship's not going to be boring. You're going to be excited to be here. We're going to be excited to meet with one another every time we come together. Because we know who God is. We know He's the Almighty, the Creator of all things. And that He is the reason why we have an opportunity to go to heaven. And for that, we praise Him. And so when we come together... If our heart's right, if, if we understand who God is and we understand who we're worshiping and why we're worshiping Him the way we do, we're going to get so much out of it. And we're going to come away with that tingly feeling. Because, you know, we don't need all the extra stuff to make us have that feeling. We get that feeling when we worship God and we worship Him the way that He wants us to. Because worshiping God and doing it His way that is where we get that feeling from. So what are we doing out, outside of these walls? How, how, how are we living for God outside of these walls? Well, an, another question I want to ask is, is, what are we doing before we get here? You know, if worship is boring to you, what are you doing to get ready to worship? And again, I'm talking to myself because a lot of times we wake up just enough time to eat and then get ready and then we're on our way to worship service. And there's no, no in-between time to take time to study for God. No in-between time to get our minds right before we come here. To study our, our lessons that we have for Bible class. You know, if we're all rush, rush every day. And when we get here and, and we just barely got here and we're, we're, we've not yet even thought about God, our worship is not going to be what it should be. Because we're not ready physically, we're not ready spiritually, mentally. And if we're not ready to worship God, we're not going to get nothing out of it. And you're probably going to be bored. And what are we doing on, on Saturday night? You know, are we going out, doing things, getting back home late, and then we're all tired when we make up. And we're just dragging to the church building. And when we get here, we, you know, we're halfway falling asleep. Is that what God wants from us? Is that giving God our very best, what He's asked for us? 
So the cure to this church boredom problem, it's not adding all these things. It's not changing the old and making some things new. It's the change within that has to happen. Because if we change within and we change our hearts, we're never going to be bored coming here. We're never going to be thinking, well, I guess I better go to the worship service. I better go up there to church. We're not going to be thinking that's something that we got to do. It's going to be something that I want to do. And we should all want to be here every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, because we get an opportunity to worship God together, an opportunity to encourage one another in our worship. And so maybe you're here this morning and you're bored. Maybe you're bored with worship. Matthew chapter 15, if you want to turn there. Matthew chapter 15. There beginning in verse 8, Matthew, or Jesus, is quoting Isaiah. In verse 8 it says, The people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. When we come together, are we worshiping God in vain? Are we just giving God lip service? Because we can be doing the right things. We can be obeying God's word to the T on how we're to worship Him, but if our hearts are not in it, if our hearts are far from it, God says that's worshiping Him in vain. And so as, as we think on these things, as we you know, ask ourselves the question, is worship born to me? And if, if that's for you, we need to look at ourselves and look at our hearts and you know, we, we need to change something because if, if you're bored in worship, that's not something good. That's not good. Because like I said, God is not a boring God and God did not design worship to be boring to him. We have to fix it. We have to fix our problem. We have to fix our hearts so that every time we come here, we are enthused, we encourage other people by our enthusiastic, and we understand that we're worshiping God, and God deserves our very best. So if you're here this morning, we're about to sing a song of invitation. And if you are here and you're not a Christian, we encourage you so much to obey the gospel to be baptized for their missing your sins, to have the blood of Jesus Christ wash away your sins. And maybe you're here this morning and you are bored. Maybe you're having a hard time coming here every Sunday. And you need prayers, and we're here to pray for you. We're here to help you out because we're a church and we're a family. And so if you need any, any need to come up at this time, we'd like to invite you as we stand and sing. Kneel at the cross, Christ will meet you there. He intercedes for you. Lift up your voice, lead with tender care, and begin life of you. Kneel at the cross, kneel at the cross, lead.
seated. Do we need any help? Are we okay? Okay. I want to commend Brother Brendan on an excellent lesson. I want to commend to each one of us an opportunity to hear a lesson like that. I pray that each one of us will have let that sink in. We're come, we've come to worship a great and awesome God, and that sure changes our perspective on life. In just a moment, we'll sing number 392. The first verse is our closing song. I would encourage us all to pray for each other. And we, we are thankful that George Walker made it this morning. And let's pray for her that she can have good days. Thank <laughs> you. 